This is Tobin Yelland, and you're listening to Talking Schmidt. It's cool, like tonight is the night. Here we go again. Just give it the old cause turn, isn't it? All big dogs in. Schmitty! 96 times, Schmitty. Thanks, Schmitty. We on? Schmitty? Talking Schmidt. That's called going to the hospital, bitch. I be <laughs> shit my pants. Glad. Your Rolodex is fucking deep. It's right. about the one. The one. The one. Who is this guy? Thinks he's tough shit. What's up? We're tastemakers. Come on, Schmitty. What the fuck? Sit here for Greg Smith. Yeah! Okay, everybody, we're back, and I'm still on Zoom, so I'm able to Zoom down to Southern California and meet up with Tobin Yelland here. You're all very, very privileged. It's an honor for me to get to spend some time with Tobin and catch up. How you doing, Tobin? I'm doing really good, considering uh, the, the times are challenging <laughs> with yeah. the, the curfew every day and uh, all that is happening in America. Yeah, are you taking it pretty serious? Are you kind of in lockdown mode or are you getting out and photographing some of the weirdness or what? Well, when I can, uh, I mean, the past three days has been curfew uh, because of the rioting, uh, oh. that the protesting, and I guess the city, uh, Los Angeles, crack, um, just trying to control the, the population. So we and I, I got a family, you know, so I'm not, I'm not really trying to, go out and protest and anything it's pretty nuts going from covid into thinking about race racism in america yeah in the same week you're go i mean social distancing to social social uniting it's pretty crazy right like i was tripping on that like uh the uh rallies like everyone's together a lot of people aren't wearing masks or giving a shit and i'm just like the COVID's still real, right? Like, what's it's kind of crazy. Yeah, that's 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 another thing. Yeah, not many people wearing masks. And well, um, my fiance loves when I uh, misguess where the person that I'm talking to is born, but okay. I'm pretty sure that you were born in Berkeley, California. I was. You're right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I always like you were born in and the guy's like nope <laughs> so you were you were born and raised in NorCal right yes um I was my parents first lived in Mendocino County um so that's about three and a half hours north of San Francisco uh -huh. so I lived there for the first three years of my life and then my mom moved to San Francisco and um and then I then after that, I would live the school year in San Francisco and summers in Northern California, in uh, Mendocino County. Okay. So. So did you, you went to school with Luke or how's it, how's this whole thing tie in where you kind of got into photography and skateboarding and everything? I think for me, um, I met everyone at the boys club. You know, in, oh, yeah, including Ray yeah. Phelps, including Julian Stranger. Even though Julian went to my middle school, I don't think I remember him then. Uh, Mike Archimedes went to my middle school. Um, I started skateboarding when I was pretty late, um, when I was 13. Uh -huh. Like really skateboarding. I had a banana board or a little plastic board when I was like seven or something. But, um, but I met everyone at the boys club ramp because they were – they were nice enough to build a, first a mini ramp and then a taller, like, I don't know if it went right to vert, but it was maybe eight feet tall or yeah. maybe a little bit bigger. It seemed big to me at the time, but uh, I met everyone there. I met um, Tommy Guerrero. And were you mostly skating then or were you already, did you already have a camera? Just skating. I was skating a lot and, and then I wasn't, I, I, wasn't super good so I would, I would skate a bit and then I would use my stepdad's uh, camera and I would shoot some photos and that was really fun and it was also a fun way to meet people right or a, a, a nice conversation starter you know taking pictures and yeah I love skateboarding and I just skate all the time what part of the city did you grow up in where were you living uh, right there I was living um I was living on Union no yeah Union near Hayes at first, when I first started skating, and I would hang out with uh, my middle school, is Marina Middle School, down in the marina, and uh, I would hang out on Union Street with all my friends and Mark Archimedes. Arco, what's up? Arco was probably a freshman in high school, um, but we'd hang out, and he was the best skater in our little bunch. 
Um, there was someone, some older, you know, photographer in the neighborhood took a picture of us back, uh, it was probably like 1983 or four, sent it to Thrasher. Jake showed it to me, but it's me, Archimedes, and Tim Lawson, I don't know, friends, friends on Union Street. No way. Damn, that's tight. So you and I crossed paths for the first time. I, do you know the year? Yeah, I believe it was like probably like 1985 or six. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I was going to guess like 88, but yeah, it was right around there. And uh, it was with Mike Alcantar. Actually, you're probably right. It was probably, I know that I took the cover of Sick Boys in 87. Oh, okay. So it had yeah. to have been 87 probably or so. earlier. Yeah. Like, so I, I, maybe neither of us remember, but. I know that you and I were at Everett School when you shot the photo of Mike doing the, uh, what was it, a venture ad where they, they call it the couch potato. Yeah. Had you already started coming to San Mateo? Because you came to San Mateo a couple of times and shot photos with us at, in the, at night just to fuck around. I can't remember if that was before or after that uh, Everett School day. I kind of think the Everett School day might have been the first day we all met. I think it was. I think that's the first day and we had a great time and then we met up again. I came down to visit you guys after that. And and then so this is like a magical day in, in skateboarding history, especially San Francisco skateboarding history. But the way it goes is we go to the back of Everett and there's a playground and there was, did we bring jump ra- There Somehow there's... Uh, Wall ride ramps. Yeah, Bryce always had his get his um, Datsun five ten wagon. He always had his um, his wall jam ramp, or you know different ramps, jump ramps that could fit in the back of his car. He'd always bring those to schoolyards. So I imagine he would have brought it. Uh huh. And then there was just a random couch there. I yeah, someone dumped a couch, and who knows? I don't. Uh, I think it probably the session probably started out just hitting the wall and then someone pushed the couch in front of the ramp. Yeah. So then Mike started, I mean, everybody was skating and Mike did a wall ride over the couch and was it, who was sitting on the couch for the ad? Was it Mickey and Mickey and Bryce? And then you're in one of the photos too. Yeah. I saw, dude. I, so I talked to Bryce like whatever, six months ago and he sent me that photo. I had never seen it. I was so stoked because I had, didn't even know that, that I don't remember that, but that was so, I was like, yes, <laughs> you know, you're so hyped when you see something for the first time that you haven't seen or you didn't even really know or remember that. So that happened. And then the same, like in, in the same session, Julian showed up and uh, they were filming for Sick Boys with Mike McIntyre. So there's Mike McIntyre, the filmer, and Mike Alcantar, the skater, which we just tripped yes. on. But uh, then we went to the front of the school where a small, like, what is it? Probably like seven stair, maybe? I don't know. It's a handrail that Julian front boarded. Maybe, I think it is the first ever front board uh, to happen on a handrail. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. That's what I heard. And that was so sick. I remember Mickey and Julian trying to uh, skate the rail at the same time. I was a little kid in the background just like sniping photos. And I think at that time, since there was no Instagram, there was like no concern of like, this kid's not going to do anything cool with these photos. So we, I mean, or maybe I was getting vibed and I didn't even know, but I yeah. ended up shooting some rad like behind the scenes photos. And oh. one of them is Mickey and Julian on the rail at the same time uh, with Mike McIntyre underneath filming. It was like such a cool day. That is really awesome. Um, yeah, that's really special. That was fun. I'd like to see your pictures. I think I've seen them somewhere before, but I, I want to see them again. And, you know, I was a little, I was a grommet, grom then too. I'd never, I had one little photo published, but barely. And I was, I was just like you. I was, I had a telephoto lens. It was a 105 lens. And I was, like Bryce was the, you know, shooting the sequences and he was right on the railing and Mike uh, McIntyre, the older guys, were dominating like the space around the rail. So I was I was lucky enough to have like a little telephoto lens, and I shot a photo I really liked 
Rad. Yeah. Um, that's the same rail, I think, later, Danny 5050, right, Sergeant? It is. Yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, it's the same. I don't know if it's the same exact, because there was a, a bunch of rails all in a row. Yeah, but it's the same. same exact one. I think Danny grinded one um, closer to, like, 18th Street or whatever, closer to um, the park. Uh-huh. Fuck. And so, yeah, like you said, that we, that was early on uh for both of us doing what we're currently doing now that was kind of, we were very green and like price was the guy we were kind of like lucky to yeah. just like let you know we were along for the ride almost and just kind of yeah. learning about like etiquette and all that stuff but uh the interesting thing too is i believe it it was either the next day or the day after the next day we all got into my VW bus and we drove to uh, Tahoe for this contest and the bus broke down on the way back. Okay. I don't remember. Was I in the bus? I think you were. Yeah. <laughs> it was, I, I know remember. Bryce was in it and I know yeah. Al, uh, Arco was in it. Uh -huh. And then it was me, Alcantar, and I, I'm pretty sure you were was in it. Was it Donner? Yeah. Yeah, that was an amazing contest too. Yeah, so you you went right. Yeah, I you, remember you being went, there. You went with us. I'm almost positive. Oh yeah, I went with you. Yeah, we were together. And, but uh, you don't the, remember the car the car breaking down? The we had to, there? No, the car broke down in Sacramento, and then we had to take the bus back to San Francisco. Uh, yeah, that's kind of almost half the trips I took were ended in a bus ride. I think. Oh really? Fuck. Yeah, so I, I remember I was not driving and I had let my friend take over because I was tired. And then I just woke up to like the engine smoking on whatever that highway is. And Oh, man. I don't think Arco remembers it either. I, I, I mentioned it to him. He's like, no, no way. And I was like, dude, the, the worst part of that is I had a camera and when we all got our shit together, I think I was super fried and I left my camera in the van. Oh, yeah. And so then the next day when we went, I, my dad drove me up there to tow it. It had been broken into and the, the camera got stolen. So none of the photos exist from that whole thing. So I'm just like, horrible. Oh, it's I, have an, I have an experience like that. It was uh, the first Sacramento street style contest. I had borrowed my stepfather's camera. It was a little Olympus XA. And I left it at a Burger King. Like I shot a bunch of photos at the contest and then went to go eat and left it there on the table at the Burger King. Fuck. That's so, the like, worst. I had to, I had to like, it was like $150 a camera at that time. So I had to like work for him to work off the price of the camera. But like the worst thing is getting the film. I know, I that, missed, you, like, that film. Yeah. Justin Martinez and Mark Gonzalez and Tommy. Oh Wilbur man. Hunter. Damn. Have you ever been held up? Has it, have you ever had your camera gear stolen? Uh, I don't think so. I think I've been, I've definitely, I've definitely had the closest I've come is leaving my, my backpack, uh, full of my camera gear in my, the trunk of my car and on Valencia street and some crackhead or someone smashed the window and stole whatever they could like tapes and just nothing um and didn't open the trunk so my camera was still there i was freaked out and then after that i think i've i've seen other people get their cameras stolen out of the cars um and things and i just would always put it on my back it was always a backpack so it was easy to take with me in the restaurants and stuff so i just like take it with me yeah so i think that's it i haven't gotten like stuff stolen hmm. have you have you been like a canon guy or a nikon guy or I got Nikons at first. Um, at first, I started out with a Minolta X700. Luke, who we started out, me and Luke Ogden started out photographing at the same time. He, his dad had a Pentax, like an old Pentax screw mount uh, system. So he just used his dad's Pentax. And then when he went to go buy a camera, he bought the updated Pentax. So he had an updated Pentax and whatever it was, and a fisheye and lenses and stuff like that. So... But after, after I, um, from Minolta, I got a Nikon F3. That was my first, like, professional camera. Um, and I had that for many years. And then I just stayed with Nikon for 
for until digital was was the most important thing to have and i got a um a canon 5d after that oh, okay so then you had to switch out all your lenses or yeah i just sold everything oh, okay uh, and then got just a, a regular canon lens and uh just like a zoom like 24 to 70 and like a um a 7200 yeah stuff. and um yeah so yeah i love nikons and Olympus, I love the little Olympus XA for just, you know, like casual, you know, sh uh, shots. Yeah. We used to use the, uh, what was that one that had the spy you looked down at? The T4. The T4. Yeah, she T4. Yeah, the T4 was genius. Just <laughs> the camera. Yeah, that was. Uh, also, um, Phil Shao, you, you got to shoot photos with him early at Greer before he was, I think he was still on uh, Confusion. Um, yeah. He has the long hair, that layback grind you shot that I think it's on your website at, on the yeah. island. Yeah. I fucking love that photo, man. That's like early I'll, Phil. Like that's who so. he was to us. Just, yeah, just like a nip. Like he was just so good. And I would see him at the San Jose uh, Kennedy Warehouse too, just, just destroying Vert. And then... And that was his home park, the Greer Park or Palo Alto Park. Yeah. So he would just destroy that park. And it was, it was amazing watching him skate. And I got to skate with him. I got to go um, uh, shoot photos of him street skating a couple times. Um, and like Jim's Ramp in Oakland and all, all over the place. Uh, he was good friends with Dan Drobel. I think when he was on Think, I would see him in the city all the time when we would shoot photos. Rad. He was my tie-in to this whole thing. Like, he was the best. It was like, he was from the city that I was born and raised. I was born in Road City. He lived in Road City. Uh -huh. So that's how we got to, like, know each other. And then we went in 92. We went cross-country to the amateur finals. And he skated vert against all the big dogs. And it was just so insane. Like, Jordan Richter, uh, Wow. Steve Bear, all those dudes were, and it, it was like, there's Phil, and you're just like, whoa, he's gonna do it. This is, yeah. And then, like, right after that, he, I think Swindell got him on Think, and then he was just, Jake loved him. It was like, for Jake, I always say this, for Jake Phelps to say, like, pretty much 100% nice things about you, <laughs> you're a pretty special person. <laughs> yeah, that's rare. Yeah. It might be one or two. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about, like, the early days with Antihero and being a part of that crew and, I mean, Hellride, all that mentality and stuff? Like, it seems like it's, like, you're kind of, like, a little, I mean, not to judge anybody but sure. you're you're a little nicer of a guy than some of those guys and you're like uh blending in with these dudes that are just going fucking ballistic well i think uh just skateboarding um in san francisco and we i think when like 19 like 1990 i lived in a warehouse with julian um mickey luke ogden uh oh. frank Claire and 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 then another another person that was went to the art institute and then she soon moved out, but um, yeah, like I think people, you know, just being in skating, you know, there's a you know skateboard companies kind of come and go, you know, and our sponsors come and go for people. I know that Julian was on SMA and then uh, then he, um, I think Steve Keenan kicked him off for something, for not filming enough for a video part or something. <laughs> and then, and then uh, he got an underworld element. Oh, yeah. That, that was awesome. And then um, I think uh, Thibo and Tommy asked him if he wanted to do a company. And he came up with a name. Um, and he asked me to come on for um, shooting photos and video. So, so I got to go meet up with those guys and talk about that, talk about what kind of, you know, creative – like look they wanted the company to be in um i remember some of the first swipe shirts being uh, having pirate emblems on the the top of the hood so it was it's kind of cool and have like a different kind of like i don't know look Rad. I don't uh, so know. it was fun being it's fun being a part of julian's uh kind of creativity and how he 
how he designs things. Because um, I remember him uh, or collaborating with him on some of his SMA ads where he would uh, just take photographs that we had taken and then, and then he would do his own ads and <clears throat> draw. <clears throat> he would write things on the, the ads and make it really personal. I really like that. Yeah, me too. Um, that's why I think I really liked working with those guys because it was uh, the um, the look of every the look of all the the print because it was all all in print. Um, what seemed really personal. Um, mm. So, yeah, they kind of still hold on to that too, like the the handwritten with the cross out, like oh, I misspelled it, I don't care, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, sick. I like that a lot. So it felt really special to me to to be uh, photographing and making videos and things of of those guys. And I did that for the first year of Antigua, Um as like I had a, a little um, a little monthly um, stipend or whatever to do that. And then huh. then that went away after the first year. Um, but I still photographed and went on trips and, and stuff after that. And was it a conscious effort for you? You used like the box cam, right? For the, some of the video, uh, like the, squ- the square, Pixel what is it? Pixel vision. Yeah. Yeah. Pixel vision. Like yeah. How, how did that happen? That was like really cool. Um, I remember at the time, just anything different. Luke really had a big influence on me for that when I, started getting to know Luke more, I'd see like he'd order these cameras that nobody had and shit. And it was like, it was cool. But like that, can you talk a little bit about that pixel vision? Sure. The pixel vision. Um, I'm not sure where I saw it, but I think people, people were using it in, um, I've seen it in a couple different movies, but um, I had a friend, you know, Mon? Mon. There was a kid I grew up with. He, he um, I lived on Golden Gate and Standing for a while. And there was a, a kid that I think he got flowed by Powell for a little while. His name was Mon and he had a pixel vision. So I knew he did. And I want to, I bought it from him. And for people that don't know what pixel vision is, it's a super cool, uh, camera that, um, it's a video camera, but it, but it records onto audio tapes when we used to use audio tapes. And so the, the imagery is, is black and white and it looks like a really shitty Xerox, like high contrast and it gives you like like you said like gives you those black borders around the the image it's just right in the center right so it's so, pretty pretty fun so i guess my question is was it an intentional like this is the look we want for antihero or did the look of antihero kind of evolve with the stuff you guys were using at the time i just had that camera i think it just evolved from wanting to do something fun and different and I also borrowed uh, Super 8 cameras from my pr- friend Xiaoping, who was going to the Art Institute. She had this really cool Bolex Super 8 camera uh, that had had like a button on the back that you could just press for, for slow motion. It was 32 frames a second. Oh, so you just press that like in the middle of a shot or wherever you wanted. It was really fun. And so a lot of that, like just borrowing the Super 8 from my friend Xiao or buying this um, uh, Pixel Vision kind of, had just gave some different looks uh, to the um, the visuals we're making. I just love the way it looked and how it worked. It's just really weird how it worked. It's just audio cassettes, and and then you have like a RCA to um, like some other weird adapter for an old TV, oh, and shit. you put it into your TV, or you put it in, and then you plug your your VHS into the TV and you'd record onto the VHS so you could have a copy. I think that's, and then we brought those VHS copies to the editing studio where we're making uh, fuck tards. And, and then, yeah, that little pixel vision video was my little thing. Okay. Yeah. So was fuck tards tape to tape then the editing process? I, I don't believe so. I think it, it was at a real editing studio. Um, okay. And it was, I think we just brought in all the all the content, which was mostly Hi8 tapes, or the the Super 8 was probably you know dub. It was probably on like a Beta SB or something like that. And huh? Yeah. When we did the Think Video Damage, we 
we got this uh, studio and, and it was tape to tape. So you're editing on the fly. Once it's built, you can't go back and swap things around. It was like before computers and you had oh, all yeah. your files. So hectic, like compared to nowadays. I look back at that. I'm like, how the fuck did we even do that? It's insane. Yeah. yeah, that was what you had. So you had to do it that way. Yeah, you didn't know any better. <laughs> Fucking crazy. Um, so early on, what do you remember first time you met Cardiel? Um, I think I might have met him at that Donner contest. I oh. don't know if I knew him before that, but I, I know that – well, I know this, that my, my buddy Brian Ferdinand, who I, I skated with all the time, I shot a lot of photos of, um, he's from Castro Valley, and, and we'd, I'd hang out with him a lot, and he – wanted to take me up to Sacramento. So we took the Greyhound bus up to Sacramento and I met Ricky Windsor and uh, Curtis and Randy Stoffer and uh, Troy Clower. And, and then through those guys and Snaggle and his brother Morgan and through those guys I met uh, Cardiel. And I believe it's probably at, I think it was, I think I went with those guys to Auburn where John lived and we were skating a mini ramp and, and John was there and we shot photos and then linked up and I think some of those those photos were um were his first Dogtown ad. And uh, I think maybe he saw me like, oh you're a photographer. I need pictures. Okay. So we we just met that way and then reconnected later and then we just kept shooting photos and skating and taking trips. Yeah. How sick I mean, dude, how many you have so many stories with those guys, right? Like you you travel a lot with them? Um, yeah, we go skating all the time. Go skating everywhere. Burnside, you've been to a few times. I've been there. First time I went there was with Brian Ferdinand, Danny Sargent, and Julian. Right. And we um, we drove up, and I had a little uh, Honda Prelude, and it was like a two door and a window because your windows would get smashed out all the time in in San Francisco in the nineties. Probably they definitely still do. I'm sure, but. Um, had one of the little side windows was smashed out and there's cardboard in it on the way up. And it was, I think it was December. So it was a little cold. Um, and it was, we had a great time skating there. We, um, uh, Mark Scott took us, we didn't, I don't know if we, I think Danny, Danny being from Seattle had friends there. And so we had places to stay. And I remember being at Mark Scott's house and him, um, cooking these huge tray trays of like tater tots and like, like some recipe with tater tots. And it was, I met, I have this visual of uh, the broiler in the oven and him like pulling out some tater tots. <laughs> right. uh, and I think we skated there for like a weekend and then came home and uh, our car broke down on the way back as it usually did. Oh man. And, and did it, we're, it broke down in the middle of the night. And so we're all sleeping in the car and we, we wake up in the morning and Danny's gone. Um, and Julian went to go look for him and he found, he was knocking on doors and he found like an open hotel door. Uh, <laughs> he found like, <laughs> he pushed open the door and like all this nice steam from the showers pouring <laughs> out. Uh, and, I, and we're just, why didn't you wake us up? Why, why couldn't you at least leave, let us sleep on the floor of your hotel room? Then we got the car fixed, and it was it was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it always. Oh man, uh, have you talked to Ferdinand lately? Yeah, I have. Yeah, he lives in Modesto. Modesto is he doing all right? Yeah, he's doing great. Huh. He's doing really great. He has um, he's married and has a daughter, and he is um, a supervisor in the motor department. I think for a police department. Oh, okay. So I think he handles all the the cars and. Wow, like, Modesto is a tough town. <laughs> it could be yeah. sketchy. Fucking hell! Uh, have you seen Jake passed? Uh, or he, uh, Jake made a zine right before he passed. Uh, it, uh, Angel Dust. Did okay. you see any of that? I didn't. Okay. Yeah, it's not fully released, but it's done. It's kind of crazy that he. I don't know. You can put some thought into those kind of things where it's like 
he finished it like the same week he passed. Like, hmm. but it, it's true. Uh, and Ferdinand's got a little interview in there, and uh, it's so sick. Like Coco's on the cover. There's fucking Wade Spire interview. It's it's all like Jake's favorite ads from the mag throughout the years, and he writes little things about it. Uh, yeah, you definitely need one of those for sure. Oh, I'd love to see it. it it's it's amazing. Yeah, uh, we were gonna do a release right before this COVID thing blew out. Yeah, it's cool. Like I, I've kind of been tripping. I just gave away all my VHS tapes and then that was like one of the few things that I was kind of bummed on. Like I didn't care about any of my DVDs or CDs, the digital stuff, but the tape stuff, I was like, oh, that's going to bite me in the ass, I think. Yeah. What do you do? You got to purge. <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah, less is more. Yeah, it feels good eventually, but some of those things are so personal that it's tough. Shout out to Ruben Frausto at Don Wapo. Shout out. Shout out to Brian Colliver in Spokane, Washington. Shout out. Shout out to Kenji at Underdog Distribution in Japan. Shout out. And this week's letter comes from Danza. And he writes, I just want to say I love the show. I work night shifts for Toyota painting cars. So the past week talking Schmidt and coffee kept me on my feet. And congrats on the four years of sobriety. That's inspiring. I am currently 254 days sober. Anyway, huge fan of the podcast. Keep it going. Just ordered some product. Keep pumping them out, and I'll keep supporting. Have a good one. Danza. Shout out. Blight. Bounce chicken. Wow, wow. <laughs> it's your boy, Big Hungry, and you're chilling on Talking Schmitz. With Schmidt and we talking shit. Watch your bitch. You, you got anything you could share with us about um, maybe a cool uh, story you got of you and Jake or meeting him or like something on the road or anything? Just funny stories from Concrete Jungle, the skate shop that was the hangout, was the best hangout for all, all of us. Um, I worked there just weekends. Um, I think he worked there more full time. And, and Luke Ogden worked there at sometimes too, like on weekends and, and stuff. And uh, I remember him just being funny. Um, the manager of the Concord Jungle's name was Cherokee, Chris Cherokee. Mm. Uh, I remember Jake finding a beeper. And then he was just, someone left a beeper in the shop or something. So he put the beeper on and said, Cherokee, you notice anything different about me? And just wearing his beeper around and heck, just making fun of customers. <laughs> uh, just a lot of a lot of funny interactions with people i don't know he taught me to set up a boy he trained me to set up boards i made lots of mistakes so i got yelled at a lot uh putting in uh skid plates remember those those yeah. plastic plates on the tails uh messed up on that a bunch what else uh going skating i don't know just those times like when me and you started when we were like 15 16 we get in the car with the older guys and being, and being excited about going. And it's just really, it was really awesome that the older guys would include us. And, and so I feel really grateful to, you know, to have been given a chance by those guys, by Bryce and Jake and Fausto and all those dudes. So. Yeah. You knew those guys pretty well by the time you worked at trans world was there there any bad vibes or bad blood or anything like I can't, can't even imagine what Jake would say to you in those times. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think even though whatever it was, um, I think just, even if, even if you weren't doing something wrong, I think the, the way we talked to each other was really pretty harsh. <laughs> like or really just really honest and really just, like, well, fuck you. <laughs> I don't know. It, it was just written in, in a normal conversation. It was pretty harsh. I, I remember. <laughs> and so, yeah, I got a lot of shit, but I think it made a lot of sense to me uh, to, um, to take, to do uh, take photos for a trans world. There, were, there are some nice people there. Thrash was amazing too. Um, it's just, there's a lot of photographers at that time, actually. And that, that plays into it, too. When, when you're the lowest person on the totem pole, you don't really get to go shoot. You don't really get to go to the big contest. You, 
that's someone else gets to do get to that. So you have to, um, like I was watching Luke had, Luke worked in the dark room. So that was his int, inter his like his first job with Rasher. Um, and it's that's eight hours dark room chemicals and <laughs> developing everyone else's film and printing everyone else's contact sheets and like, and then coming home at five o'clock and just like, just passing out. Oh, right. Man. So I, I saw him <laughs> doing that and, and I may have had a chance to do that, but, but I saw, I did see a chance to get some photos published in trans world and I did that oh, and at, at that time too. You kind of had to photograph for just one magazine, even though they didn't pay you much. Like right. there's not, there's no real, like they they didn't give you enough money to really like <laughs> to have you just be uh, work for one magazine, but you just had to because there was like they were just kind of fighting for territory, you know. Right. And um, but it was funny when I got one photo published in Trans World, and I that's that's it. You kind of have to go photograph for them because because everyone else hates you now. Yeah, I never <laughs> liked that guy anyway. Yeah, <laughs> but that guy. yeah, you got a picture of that. Uh, um, but then it was it was kind of a funny a funny time because then uh, kind of um, I would take photos for uh, SMA and they would. Uh, I remember Nadas giving uh, Thrasher uh, maybe I think Mofo a picture I took, and then he wouldn't run it, and even oh. though it wasn't for a Thrasher, it was for SMA. So the next time that not as gave him a picture, he, he told Mofo he didn't know who took the picture. Oh, so he got. Then we got in the door that way. I know. I know somebody that was submitting footage for Transworld videos, and they would put uh, an alias in the credits so that they wouldn't yeah. get fucking yelled at by the old man. <laughs> yeah. Fuck. Yeah, but then then soon after that. I remember I got a lot of shit and we were, we were like 18, me and Luke at that time. And I was getting a lot of shit and just trying to figure out what I was doing. And I'm not sure what happened with Luke, but at some point, like the older guys were giving him shit too. And he called up, he called up Mofo and he's like, said some, said some bad words, like, just like you, you know, shoot him out like in a message to the, um, to the receptionist mm. and then he got fired from that. <laughs> and so then after he got fired, uh, we were both shooting for trans world. Oh shit. So, and then, and then, we, did, then we did this big San Francisco article, which turned out really awesome. And, um, Jimmy Thibault's on the cover. Ah, and it was a big article. And then, then we just photograph every day. And at one point, Grant Britton said that, out of all the contributing photographers that sent photos to Transworld, uh, Luke and I had the biggest folders of, of image because we're just shooting every day. So much, Brad. Were you going to um, that place down on Bryant uh, to develop your film? I New think Lab? it was called The New Lab. Yeah. Yeah. I would go there every day. I would see Luke there. I would see yeah. Gabe Morford there. Yeah. Um, and Those times were so fucking right. special. Like, yeah, you drive in the morning to get to get to finally see what you shot because there's no instant anything, and you would see another photographer coming or going, and you'd be like, ah, "I remember that so vividly." Like, I would pick up film for, uh, you know, if I was going to pick up film, Luke would be like, "Hey, I got some rules too," or whoever else. Like, yeah, and uh, everybody use that place. It's 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 right there, Fifth and Brian, I think, right around there. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. I, I'd love to see people and check out new photos. Rad. Um, and so, what's going on nowadays? Um, where, where are you living? I'm living in Los Angeles, um, in uh, View Heights, Los Angeles. We just moved a little while ago. Huh. Um, been here for almost ten years. How you like it? I like it a lot. Yeah, yeah. I like Los Angeles. Yeah. Cool. Um, and, and you got a website and you're, you got some of your, uh, prints on there and stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, at first I was selling some prints on my website, tobenyellen.com. And then, then I started a separate website that uh, was more like a store and it's called tobenshop.com. And I had like about two weeks before COVID, I had maybe 25 prints up 
And now I have almost 100. And my goal is to have 250 because that's the maximum for my, my little website is 250. So that's my goal. Wow. So if you go there, if you don't see what you're looking for, email me and I'll, I'll look for it and put it up. Um, oh, okay. So it's growing. Like every week there might be a few new additions. Yes. Yeah. I put up a bunch yesterday. Oh, how cool. I put up, I put up a new photo of Rick Abicetta. Um, then I'm going to send you two for your China banks. Thing. Yeah. The uh, rolling one. Yeah. yeah. It's rolling in. Yeah. Yeah. That's a it, cool one. It was from 1990. Rad, dude. 30 years ago. That's insane. Yeah, right? Oh, man. So how, how collected is your archives? Like, are you pretty organized? Oh, sick. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I, have, I do have some organization. I have a file maker system that I, I have a lot of my photographs numbered and then put in the system with names and places. So mm. I can look up um, uh, Greg Schmidt and find you if oh. if I have you in there. But there's a lot of stuff that's not um, that I haven't put in yet. But I have it fairly organized. At oh, least yeah. I have the system. I need to I need to put in more names and like do a lot of like you know computer work like that. But but I do have it there, and I got a printer uh, in my little office zone, so I I can make prints. Nice. So, so. Is uh, one photo um, stick out to you as kind of, since you've started selling photos, is there one that sells more than the others or? Oh, no. Like, let me show you. I got some, I got a bunch of prints right here. I love oh, I sick. I really like this one at Ray Barbie. Uh, oh, yeah. Ray Barbie, was, it was taken for, uh, he's doing a nose grind on the back, on the back of, of a bus bench, bench on, on, on Balboa Street. Uh, in San Francisco, and I think we're just looking around for a, we, we're me, Julian, and Ray Barbie, and I think maybe Ethan Fowler. We're just driving around uh, looking for spots to skate, and uh, in this shot, Julian was holding the flash off to the side, like standing in the in the street. Rad. Ray did like twenty of the. I have so many good photos, like it, it's hard to choose which one. Um, yeah. But got that. That's that's one. Oh, and this one. Of uh, John, oh, that's fun. Good to John and Julian, I think probably already just, out um, through the rafters at uh, what was the name of Andy's that? Ramp. Andy's ramp, yeah, in Oakland. Oh, that was was that Big Brother cover? It was, yeah, yeah, so sick. That one probably that John Cordell, or and also from from that first day that we met, Julian doing the front board slide. Right. People love Sean Young too. Absolutely, like a lot of people getting into. And that's oh, the that point. Ramp. Sick. Front side air. That's nice. That was huge. That was for Jay Lofty. I don't oh. know if you remember that clothing company. Yeah, I do. Uh, but, Ray Dillon, right? Yeah, Ray Dillon was involved in that. Yeah. yeah. Holy shit. Since you've kind of started selling things, do you think that people are more drawn to your artistic approach or your subject? Like, would you think like, oh, Julian's going to sell more than this guy no matter what it looks like? Or do you think people are like, I love this photo? Well, I hope it's for both. I think, I think a great skate photo is, is uh, both composition, lighting, whatever, you know, whatever kind of, you know, effect you can put on it. I like, um, I like shooting in dusk and like this Rick Abicetta photo shooting like, just before it got dark and, and seeing the, the trait using a flash the streaks. The streaks. I like that a lot. I love that. I got in, really inspired by Spike Jones who would do that a lot. Mm. And so, so I, yeah, I hope it's, I think a great skate photo is like a combination of the, a great skateboarder. Right. And then, and then also a combination of good lighting and shutter speed and just technical kind of stuff. But I think more than technical, it's the art side of it that makes it like something that you really like to see. It's something that like clicks in your brain. I think mm -hmm. you look at it and you're like, you're not quite sure what it is, but it just, it's that's, just, it, you just like it. Yeah, that's it. Uh, also, could we talk a little bit about the um, skateboards? I saw that, um, well, I know because I'm good friends with Jason. Jesse, you did uh, some photo limited runs with him. You did some with Andy Roy, I believe. Right, where yeah. they put your photo on the bottom of the board and numbered them. You guys both signed them and then sold them off. Um, yes. I think it's probably runs of 100, yeah? Yes. 
that seemed to be pretty cool, right? Like that was, people were stoked on that. I know Andy yeah. was hyped that you're helping him out and you guys are providing people with some cool shit. Yeah, that, that was a fun project. And it's, yeah, it's fun to, it's fun to make something limited edition. Um, I'm, I'm working with a, a small print company in Bakersfield um, to make some limited edition capsule. It's, they're going to come with a t-shirt, a poster, and the drawings of the camera that I use to take the photograph as a pin and a sticker. So I think in the next few weeks, though, we're going to come out with three of them. Uh, one of them is going to be uh, Cardiel doing the wall ride, the glass wall ride in Bakersfield. Uh-huh. And that, that capsule, we're going to, we're going to donate proceeds to Ben Smith. Um, Cause he's, he's going through chemotherapy and he's a skateboarder uh, from Bakersfield. That's going to look really good. I've seen the mock-ups look good. And then another one is the, the uh, Corey Chrysler throwing a skateboard through his car oh, windshield. Yeah. That one's so um, sick. That one. And, and the third one is going to be Ethan Fowler, uh, 16th emission, um, doing it like a big indie air out of 16th emission. Uh, oh. I really love the photo. He's, it, it's not very, like his face is a little blurry and I, I like it. it huh. There's a lot of emotion. In it, so we're going to do three. That'll be fun. So yeah, Ethan was the style man. Miss Ethan footage. He was one of a kind. Yeah, he's out in, in Iowa, I think. It's from Ed. Yeah, that was the cover of the video, right? No, it was. It was. Uh, this is an outtake. The cover of the video was just a, a straight ollie. Oh, okay. This is Gons, New York. Oh, rad. I'll send you some photos after this. Okay. Uh, that reminds me, that picture of Mark that you just showed me reminds me, I think you were one of the first people that I ever saw do this, where you shot a sequence rolling on your skateboard. Oh, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because we started out with um, Phil Shao, and I think Phil Shao is one of the first people that I did that with because, and I think that that came, that came because I think you probably shot still photos and video, right? Yeah. Right? So I was always doing that, you know, following, follow cam. Right. And then with, for sequences, still sequences, um, the, uh, the camera I used, the Nikon F3, you could make the sequence go faster if you locked up the shutter. So you, you, you lock up the shutter, you can't see out of it. It's a fisheye anyway, so you kind of get everything. Yeah. But I, I shot, a, and I'm going to send you this too, but I shot a, a Nolly nose blunt slide sequence of Phil Shao, um rolling like that, rolling with a still camera. At Stanford? Yeah. I think it's at Stanford, yeah. Yeah, I think I remember that on those planner boxes. Yeah. Fuck, how sick. Yeah, I'm going to send that to you. Rad. Yeah, man, that stuff is priceless. It's cool. Everybody that's listening, what is it, TobinYellen.com? Um, there's TobinYellen.com for my, my main website, but my shop, like with all my skate photos, is TobinShop.com. Oh, okay. And that's the one that's growing where you're adding to it? Yeah. I've got a hundred images now and I'm going to, my goal is 250. Rad. And do you offer different sizes? Yeah. I offer small sizes, you know, for, um, under a hundred bucks and up to 13 by 19. And then every print you get comes with like a free, um, you get free four by six, a mystery print. Ah, dude, you're killing it. That's awesome. I love those photos. You gave me a little stack of, uh, last time I saw you of Jake with a car. It's just skating in the city with a, there's a car coming at him and he's coming down the hill. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, that was, we shot for an interview in some, in a magazine. Um, he was just coming down. I forgot what street it is, but it's coming down like South of market right near the old, uh, anchor brewing, uh, brewery over there, like off Missouri or somewhere. I don't know. Right. But there was a really cool. 64 on Paula pulling out and he's coming down the hill. Yeah. Yeah. That was a fun day. That's his zone. Farley's Coffee right up the street. <laughs> yeah. Fucking hell. Well, fuck, I could talk to you forever, but I don't want to take too much of your time. Yeah, great to talk to you. Thanks for having me on your podcast, Greg. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, do you got, uh, you been listening to anything cool recently? Can we throw a little fucking song or something up to end this on? Yes. The Clash Guns of Brixton. Ah, fuck yeah. Hey, also speaking of that, do you have, me and my fiance have been watching like a different documentary almost every night. 
Do you have any must-sees? Yeah, Harlan County, USA. Okay. Har- you heard about that? I don't know. It's not the it, one that's like the East Coast one, is it? Yeah, it's East Coast, somewhere in Virginia or something like that. It's I a, think we saw it. It's a coal mining place. Some yeah, kind of, and one of the guys is like a pro tap dancer or something. Really? I, I forget. It's been so long since I saw it, but it's a gnarly strike, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Like conflicts that's going on. We saw it's, that. Yeah, it's nuts, man. The, the, the part where there's someone drives by with a shotgun and blow, just shoots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we just watched the Black Panthers one last night. It was pretty heavy. Like, wow. they have some epic footage. You're like, how the fuck were they filming this shit? Yeah. It's pretty cool. But yeah, we've been watching a different one every night. I got to show her Gummo. She's never seen that one. Yeah, Gummo's a good one. Yeah. Uh, Mingus 68. There's one on Charles Mingus. I think it's 68 uh, or six, something like that. But uh-huh. it's this... Just, just this young uh, film crew went and shot him, went and made this documentary about him, and it's really beautiful. Okay, we'll check that. Because we just saw the Miles Davis one uh, when it came out on Netflix, but Mingus, oh, cool. uh, yeah, I want to see that. Yeah, let, dude, we've, we've watched, like, I think, uh, without a stretch, at least 50 during this COVID. Yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, you got to do something positive. <laughs> you're going to finish Netflix. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're out. Well, cool. Um, yeah, dude. And let's stay in touch with this China bank scene. I'm going to need your help for sure. Yeah, I, I, get, I got that. And then I got to look through my videotapes, but I got whatever. I got some video footage, I'm sure, but it's just hard to find. Okay. Yeah. I mean, were you there when John 50 50 did it? Uh, I think I filmed that. No way. Because I think that was the first ever uh, top rope trick. I think John was the first person to do anything up there. Yeah, probably, yeah. So, yeah, I'm going to have to, I'm using, I'm leaning on Archimedes a bunch for like the early stuff. And I just want it to be like, I want Jake to look down and then not be able to yell at me like, that's not fucking Phil Shen. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Sean Fleming, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Well, cool, man. Uh, stay healthy and hopefully we'll be able to see each other in real life sooner than later. Yes. Sounds good, Greg. Thank All you. Right. Have a great day. Yeah. Take care, Tobin. Thank you for listening to another episode of Talking Schmidt. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Anchor, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. When you subscribe, you'll get notifications every Tuesday of new episodes the minute they become available. Also, please leave reviews and a five-star rating. It's the best way to help the show grow. All of the episodes will always remain free, but if you would like to help support the show, you can do so at TalkingSchmidt.com, where you can pick up some merchandise like t-shirts, beanies, hats, and stickers. The website has an entire archive of all of the episodes, with extra photos and videos. Email us with any suggestions, comments, or ways that the show may have improved your life at talkingschmidt at gmail.com. All interviews are conducted, edited, and produced by Schmitty. The intro music is Mary's Cross by the band Nature. Very special shout out goes to the executive director, Cheryl Camisa. Shout out. Love it! This is Talking Schmidt, where the Rolodex is deep, but the conversation is deeper.